A vast Spanish invasion fleet, the mightiest ever assembled, was sweeping towards the channel. And the only thing that stood between the invaders and the conquest of England were the ships of the Royal Navy. For the Spanish, it was a religious crusade against an island of heretics and pirates. For the English, it was a battle for survival against the might of a Spanish armada. In 1588, Spain was busy assembling a vast fleet, an armada. Spain was the largest superpower on earth, and this armada would be the greatest concentration of naval power ever assembled. Its purpose, to invade and conquer England. Spain was Catholic and wanted a Catholic world. Spain's king, Philip II, was a man driven by religious obsession. For him, empire building was about extending the power of the Catholic Church. Standing in his way was Protestant England, led by heretic Queen Elizabeth. But the conflict between England and Spain wasn't just about religion. Spain's empire spanned half the globe, and it controlled all the riches of the New World. England wanted a share that was kept out by force. For years, Elizabeth had fought back, sending out her sailors to raid Spanish treasure ships. Then relations between the two countries edged even closer to all-out conflict. Here in Flanders, the Spanish army was already fighting its own religious war. 30,000 troops were scattered throughout the region, defending fortified towns like this one from the Protestant rebels. To the fury of the Spanish, England sent troops to help the Dutch rebels. For the Spanish king, this was the final straw. England was now taking Spanish gold, insulting its religion, and interfering with its wars. Enough was enough. It was time to sort out this irritating little country once and for all. Philip's plan was to mount an ambitious combined operation using his army in Flanders and the fleet he was assembling. This massive armada would sail all the way from Spain packed with soldiers and naval firepower. Its task would be to sail right the way up the English Channel to its narrowest point here between Dover and Calais. And there, it would meet up with that Spanish army in Flanders and escort it across to England. Philip hoped that this combined force would be unstoppable. This was to be a military operation on an unprecedented scale. The Armada would have to carry over 20,000 men and their weapons and supplies a thousand miles, and then launch an invasion. To the Spanish, this wasn't just an invasion force, it was a religious crusade. Queen Elizabeth had got word from her spies that an attack was imminent. She knew that England's only hope lay in her navy. The Spanish Armada was a breathtaking military force. Medina Sidonia had gathered 130 ships. The fleet carried 7,000 sailors 
and nearly three times as many soldiers. Never before had the world seen such a concentration of naval power. And it was heading straight for England. Here is the English coast, from Plymouth right the way along into Cornwall. The westerly wind was blowing the Armada here steadily eastwards. Drake and Howard, coming out of Plymouth Harbour here, decided to split their forces. Howard's plan was to take the main body of the fleet out to sea, whilst Drake was to head westwards along the coast. Their aim was to get to the west of the Spanish Armada. This was critical because the wind was blowing from the west and if they could get round to this side, then they would have the all-important advantage of having the wind behind them. But to get to that position, they had to sail into the wind and sailing into the wind was very tricky and it still is. Sailing into the wind is hard work even on a modern sailboat. On the huge square rigged galleons of the time, it required great skill and coordination. All the next day, the Spanish continued heading east towards the meeting point with their army. The lookout strained to catch sight of the English fleet, expecting them to appear somewhere in front of them. Then, at dawn on Sunday the 31st, Two days after they'd arrived, they finally spotted them. But to their shock and amazement, the English ships were now behind them. And worse still, they were getting ready to attack. The wind was blowing steadily from over here, from the west. And the two squadrons of the English fleet had zigzagged into the wind to get it behind them, giving them an advantage over the Spanish. The English fleet numbered just 55 ships, including the 11 in Drake's squadron. The Spanish fleet was more than twice that size, over 120 ships. They'd now formed into a pre-arranged battle formation, a huge crescent two miles across. At each horn of the crescent, here and here, were two big fighting squadrons, huge galleons, these of up to 50 guns each. In the centre, Medina Sidonia himself, commanding more big fighting ships, whilst all around them, the less well-armed supply ships protected within that close-packed crescent. It was an effective defensive formation, almost impossible to break up. And the Armada had another advantage. Each vessel was loaded with soldiers, as many as 350 on a single ship. The Spanish fought in the age-old, traditional way. They took grappling hooks like this, and they hurled them across the enemy ships, dragged the ships together, and then would leap across and fight it out hand to hand on the enemy decks. In this kind of fighting, the Spanish had a massive advantage because of their huge ships bristling with soldiers. The English, with their smaller ships and smaller crews, liked to keep their distance, and instead they battered their enemy into submission with their guns. The two sides weren't only using different tactics, they also sailed in very different formations. Now with the wind behind them, the English could put this new strategy into action in a ferocious two-pronged attack on the Armada. Howard now swung around, aiming to attack the southern horn of the Crescent using the English line astern formation. Meanwhile, Drake was going to concentrate his attack on the northern tip. The two commanders knew the fate of England was in their hands. <laughs> As each ship turned to face the Armada, the English sailors hoisted up every sail they could and used the favourable wind to carry them headlong into battle. As they approached the giant Spanish ships for the first time, they realised just how powerful their adversary was. Below decks, the gunners loaded the cannons, ready for firing. 
At last, the Armada was just a quarter of a mile away. The Ark Royal was leading the attack, and the Spanish ships were now within range of its cannons. The order was given to fire. After another, the English were able to outmaneuver the Spanish and bring their guns to bear on the ships of the Armada. And all the while, the English kept their distance to avoid being boarded. Their strategy was working. For the Spanish, this was a major blow. They couldn't get close enough to use their grappling hooks. And whilst most of the Spanish ships were protected by their tight formation, the ships at the tip were on the receiving end of wave upon wave of English cannon fire. Finally, the English pulled back, triumphant that not a single one of their ships had been boarded. But despite firing over 2,000 cannonballs, they'd failed to sink a single Spanish ship. The Armada was still intact and as powerful as ever. The English had done nothing that day to dent the invasion plan. For some reason, the English cannons simply weren't doing enough damage. Right, let's load this thing. Okay, here's the charge. Nice and gently. Okay, the shot's in, I'm gonna ram it down. No, and how long would this process exactly take ram. on a ship? We could do it pretty quickly with a, a, a trained crew. I think you'd get a round away in a, in a minute or... About a round yeah, a minute? Yeah. Then the next thing to go right. in would be uh, the shot. Well, it weighs about three pounds. About three, three pounds pounder. Of cast iron. And That's they went up to a ball, ten times that size. There she goes. There it is. And Trunk. then to stop it falling out, we put in the top wad, which on a ship would be old rope broken up. And here we were going to use straw because when the ship rolls, we don't want the ball the shot to falling out. And fall it keeps out. it in. Now you give that a good tap home. And just get ready for priming. That's I'm right. pricking now a little hole in the cartridge inside, right? Okay. Yes, so, that, what, so, that releases the powder so that when you well, ignite it, the so, powder goes off and the ball spurts out the end. That's, that's right. There you go, physics. That's if right. we can manage this here, why didn't the English do more damage to the Spanish? And it depends what you mean by damage. I mean, you can make a three-inch diameter hole in the side of a ship, but that's not going to sink a ship because it's easily fixable, you can plug it up. It's going to cause casualties on board and it may disable it, but to actually sink a ship, you have to pepper the side of the boat with those holes. So we've got to imagine the Spanish running around with a big plug, shoving them in. Absolutely. Taking casualties, but plugging up the holes. And ships not sinking because no. of these, even though peppered with holes like this. On that first day of battle, the English sailors kept their distance, but that meant only the occasional cannonball hit its mark. And so, at the end of that day, the Armada sailed on virtually unscathed. It's the shape of a ship that determines how effective it is at sailing. The sleeker the vessel, the more manoeuvrable it is. The Spanish ships were built very high out of the water. They were very top-heavy and cumbersome. They were ready to take lots of men and supplies. So they were like floating fortresses. The English ships were much faster and more manoeuvrable. They'd taken the traditional galleon design and made it sleeker. It was now Tuesday the 2nd of August, five days after the Armada had arrived. Medina Sidonia had led his ships as far as this, Portland Bill in Dorset. People watching here could have seen the ships clearly out to sea there. This was the scene 
of a second fierce battle. Once again, the Spanish formation held firm. Once again, the English failed to make any impact. But in fact, Medina Sidonia was very concerned. He'd been expecting to get word from the Spanish troops in Flanders to confirm that they were prepared for the invasion. But he'd heard nothing. He was now at a critical point in the voyage. He was approaching the Isle of Wight, and he still didn't know whether the army in Flanders was ready. It's a quirk of English geography that there are many big harbours west of the Isle of Wight, but none at all beyond it to the east on this stretch of coast. So once past this point, there was no place for the Armada to shelter, not even in Flanders itself. If the Spanish sailed on, they'd be taking a gamble that the army was all set to go. Later that morning, the wind at last picked up. Now, the real battle could commence. The two fleets were here, just south of the Isle of Wight. The Armada seemed to be heading for the sheltered waters, just around the corner in the Solent here where they could seize the Isle of Wight. The English had just hours in which to stop them. Howard and Drake had decided to split the English fleet into four separate squadrons to give them maximum freedom to fight independently. Drake took his squadron south. Another squadron attacked the Armada from the north. But this attack did little damage to the Spanish. The two remaining squadrons then joined the fierce melee heading for the center of the Spanish Crescent. But through the dense gun smoke, the English could see the Armada drifting ever closer to the vulnerable entrance to the Solent. The campaign was now to take a decisive turn. Drake made a brilliant move. He'd already led his ships out to sea. He now appeared from the open sea and brought his firepower to bear on the ships at the southern tip of the Spanish formation. Medina Sidonia saw this and sent reinforcements southwards to their defense. Drake had distracted the Spanish commander at the critical moment. Instead of turning into the sheltered waters of the Solent, the Spanish Armada found itself heading for one of the most treacherous hazards in the English Channel, the dreaded sandbanks of the Hours. English sailors had left the Armada with no choice. To avoid running aground on the Hours, the Spanish had to turn away from the Isle of Wight into the open sea. For the time being, the Spanish had been prevented from setting foot on British soil. For Medina Sidonia, the die was now cast. For better or worse, the Armada was set on a one-way course towards Flanders to meet up with the army. If all went according to the Spanish plan, they could still launch a joint invasion in a matter of days. On Saturday the 6th of August, the Armada was finally nearing its destination. Despite all the best efforts of Drake and Howard, it had sailed the entire length of the English Channel without losing a single ship to those English guns. And now it was in the Straits of Dover, the narrowest part of the Channel, and within 25 miles of that Spanish army in Flanders. Medina Sidonia was still hoping that the 30,000 Spanish troops would be ready and waiting on the coast. But they were nowhere near ready. In fact, word had only just reached the troops of the Armada's progress. They started gathering as fast as they could, but the preparations would still take days. This was disastrous news for Medina Sidonia. It would mean the Armada waiting around in the open sea at the mercy of the elements and the English. It was a naval commander's worst nightmare. 
from the point of view of the English sailors, the situation looked equally desperate. For all they knew, the Armada was about to be joined by the troops for the final assault on England. It was their last chance to destroy the Spanish fleet. So far, the Armada's tight formation had proved immune to attack, and somehow the English had to find a way to break it up. So, on Sunday the 7th of August, Drake and Howard met to plan their attack. And they decided to use a weapon that struck fear into every sailor on a wooden ship. Fire. English sailors prepared eight full-sized ships for sacrifice. They loaded them with barrels of tar. They even put two cannonballs in each cannon so that when the flames reached the powder, they would explode at random. The moon was full that night, which meant the tide would run strong. At midnight, the English sailors set the ships alight and let the wind and tide carry them right into the middle of the Spanish fleet. As the fire ships drifted towards the Armada, the Spanish raised the alarm. <laughs> The terrified soldiers desperately tried to haul the burning boats out of the way. Most of the ships simply cut their cables and abandoned their anchors in the mad rush to escape. In the confusion, the Spanish ships were scattered far and wide. There were several collisions, and one even ended up grounded. Even though not a single Spanish ship actually caught on fire, the fear was enough to achieve the required objective. By the morning, the Spanish Armada was in disarray. But Drake suddenly discovered that Howard and more than 20 English ships had completely disappeared. Incredibly, at this critical moment, Howard had shown that he too had a deep piratical streak. And they'd gone off to loot a Spanish ship that had gone aground. Once again, the greed of the English cost them valuable time. While Howard chased after Spanish booty, Drake led the rest of the English fleet into a conflict unlike any that had been fought before, the Battle of Gravelines. What followed was a frantic struggle, which both sides knew would decide the fate of the Armada. The Armada had been scattered by the fire ships and was spread out along the coast. Only Medina Sidonia's flagship and four others had managed to stand their ground here. They bore the brunt of Drake's first attack. For over an hour, Medina Sidonia held back the English onslaught, giving the rest of the Armada time to reform. Finally, Howard returned from his private looting expedition and joined in the attack. But by now, 50 of the Spanish ships had formed their own defensive crescent, and Drake now sailed on to attack it, realizing that this main body of Spanish ships was the force that had to be broken. Drake decided to take an enormous risk. He led his ships much closer than in any of the previous battles. Soon, they were in amongst the ships of the Armada. The experience for those on board would have been very, very different from the other battles. The ships were now so close that either side could fire their muskets and even hurl abuse at each other. One English ship came so close to a Spanish ship that a foolhardy English sailor jumped aboard but was killed instantly. 
by getting near, the English were at last able to hit the Armada with shot after shot, doing terrible damage to the ships and their crews. The Spanish were suffering huge numbers of casualties as the English ships pounded them from close range. Down below decks on the Spanish ships, cannonballs smashed through the hull, meaning certain death for anyone in the way, and sending splinters the size of daggers flying through the air. The English were blasting away. The Spanish guns were only managing to fire about once an hour, or even less. What was really slowing them down was lack of experience. These guns are very complicated to fire, and the Spanish ships actually had more priests on board than trained gunners. Instead, it was the job of the soldiers to fire the guns, but they had no experience of fighting at sea. So for most of the battle, the Spanish couldn't even fight back. After eight hours of intense fighting, the English were running out of ammunition. We'd fired so much and done so much damage that by the end of the battle we were grabbing anything we could use. Using chain instead of cannonballs, we were loading anything we could get our hands on. Around four in the afternoon, the English fired their last shots and were forced to pull back, hoping that they'd inflicted fatal damage on the Spanish. The Spanish fleet was in tatters. Over 600 Spanish were dead. Many hundreds more were badly wounded. One Spanish ship had been sunk, two driven ashore, and the rest severely damaged. And now the wind was blowing them helplessly towards the treacherous sandbanks of Flanders. If the ships went aground, it would have been certain death, either by drowning as the ships broke up in the surf or at the hands of the English. As the sandbanks drew nearer, the depths got more and more threatening. 60 feet, 50 feet, and then 40 feet. The biggest Armada ships needed about 30 feet of water. Destruction was moments away. On board ship, the priests took final confessions. Most of the sailors couldn't even swim. Death seemed inevitable. Just as the ships were on the point of being wrecked, the wind changed. It came round to the southwest and blew the Armada out into the North Sea. They believed that they'd been saved by the will of God. The wind may have saved the Spanish from the sandbanks, but it drove them away from their army. Philip's grand plan to conquer England and return it to the Catholic fold had failed. The Spanish sailors now had only one aim, to get home. The English were still blocking the channel, so the Armada's only route home was right round Scotland and Ireland and circling back to Spain. It was a long and arduous journey. Soon supplies were running dangerously low. By the time the fleet arrived off Ireland, men were dying every day from hunger and thirst. Conditions on board must have been horrific. It was the weather that dealt the final blow to the Armada. Many of the surviving ships were caught by fierce storms as they crawled down the west coast of Ireland. The broken ships and weakened men were simply no match for the elements. They were far too poorly equipped to cope. Dozens of Spanish ships were wrecked, thousands of sailors were drowned. And of those who did get ashore, many were robbed by the locals, and the rest were captured and then butchered by English soldiers. Only the nobles were spared, kept prisoner 
until they could be sold back to Spain. Only a third of the men came back alive. Medina Sidonia himself almost died of dysentery. His second in command died of shame only days after he arrived home. The Armada was worse than a failure. It was a national tragedy. But for England, the defeat of the Armada was a turning point, a triumph that would become legendary. England had defended its faith. And to this day, Britain remains a Protestant state. The coming centuries would see Spain decline and Britain taking a turn as Europe's leading power. The Royal Navy would play a central role in winning Britain, an empire greater than any the world had ever seen. And it all began with the defeat of the Spanish Armada. <laughs> 